Hey folks, this is Danuzi. Welcome back to my channel. And for today video, I'm going to present you the BlizzCon 2017 about World of Warcraft. What is going to happen next? Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the World of Warcraft What's Next panel. Hello, BlizzCon. So. It's such an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for tuning in online. Could not be more excited on behalf of the entire Warcraft team to share with you what we've been working on pretty much since the moment Legion came out, the next chapter in World of Warcraft, Battle for Azeroth. Now, I know every BlizzCon is special, and I'm a bit biased here, but there's something particularly special about WoW expansion announcement BlizzCons. So this is going to be a good day. So I know you have a lot of questions after what you've seen. And so we're going to try to walk you through a whirlwind tour of what this expansion has to offer, the setting, the story, the characters, the features, the systems, and more. So without further ado, let me introduce our creative director, Alex Afrasiabi, to tell you about the world of Battle for Azeroth. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Nice shirt. This is the new shirt. Hello, BlizzCon. It's good to see you all again. We are here today to talk about the battle for Azeroth and prepare you for the coming war. By now, we've all seen that incredible cinematic. We're from the get-go battle lines are drawn. And what I like best about that cinematic, and it does so many things so well, is that it reinforces the foundations of Warcraft. Because whether we're fighting the Burning Legion, the Scourge, Old Gods, Dragon Aspects, Elemental Lords, or yes, time-traveling orcs. <laughs> our hearts and minds are with our factions. We do what we do in this world, first and foremost, for the Horde and, and for the Alliance. not them. And that makes us, the champions of Azeroth, the greatest hope the world has ever known, and also its biggest threat. But this is wow. We don't just get to watch awesome cinematics, we get to live them. Because to get to the battle for Azeroth, you're going to have to go through the battle for Lordaeron. Like the Broken Shore, we'll pick up where the cinematic left off. And what goes down that day will change Warcraft history forever. Now, some of you might be asking, hey Alex, why, hi, why would the Alliance attack the Undercity? It's a good question. It's a good question. Here's a better question. Why would the Horde burn down Teldrassil? <laughs> did Teldrassil fall first? Did Teldrassil fall first and lead to the attack on the Undercity? Or, or was the burning of Teldrassil a response to the bold alliance attack on Lordaeron. You'll find out. Think about this. The stage is set for an alliance-controlled Eastern Kingdoms and a horde-controlled Kalimdor with one great big sea separating the two continents, which leads us to our search for allies. In our quest for victory, we will seek out the Kul Tirans as the Alliance and the Zandalari as the Horde. Coincidentally, 
Coincidentally, both of these nations have extremely powerful navies, which we're going to need to span that great sea. Let me leave you with this thought. No boats. Some boats. Let me leave you with this thought. No matter who fired the first shot, we are in an all-out war. It's our duty as alliance. That's right. As horde. To defend our people, our families, and our homes. This is the battle for Azeroth. So to recap, the Alliance and the Horde are in an all-out war. Old hatreds have reignited as both factions strike at each other's hearts. Now, with the world divided, we seek out lost territories and new powerful resources. And with no external threats, we turn our fury on each other. We fight for our faction's survival and our place in this world. And to win this war, we're gonna need all the help we can get, which leads us to find new and old allies alike. And that takes us to Kul Tiras and Zandalar, which opens up two new continents to the game, which we're gonna take a look at right now. Woo! All right, starting with Kul Tiras for the Alliance. Kul Tiras was founded 3,000 years ago when a group of Gilneans left the old empire to explore the Great Sea. They came upon this cold, mountainous island, rich in natural resources, and decided to settle in. Now, over the course of the next 2,500 years, the Kulturans built the most powerful navy on Azeroth, a navy that the Alliance really, really wants. Today, Kulturus is ruled by four houses, which we'll find out are in a bit of trouble. And before we're going to get the Kulturans to join our side, we're going to need to help them with their problems. Lastly, Kulturus is broken up into three main regions. We've got Tiergard Sound in the middle, the Drusfar in the southwest, and Stormsong Valley in the north. Let's take a look at the zones of Kulturus. All right, first up, we've got Tiergard Sound. So Tiergard Sound sits on an inlet in the middle of the continent and it connects the great sea. It's the main connection point for all of the different zones. Now, within Tiergard, we'll find the capital city of Kul Tiras, Boralis. This will also be the Alliance's main base of operations in the battle for Azeroth. So this will be your hub. Now, I mentioned that Kul Tiras was ruled by four houses. When we get to Tiergard, we'll meet the first of these houses, led by a familiar name, Proudmore. Meet Catherine Proudmore, everybody. This is Jaina's mother, and I want to go on record here and just head this off. She is 100% not a dreadlord. <laughs> not. Now, Kulturans, Kulturans by nature are monster hunters, specifically big, nasty sea monsters, which has led to a much hardier breed of human, like these big fellows over here. And I also mentioned that the zones each have their own problems. Well, in, Kultir in Tiragard, one of the problems has to do with pirates. Normally, the outlaws of Kul Tiras hang out at the pirate city of Freehold. But in recent months, they've gotten a little bold and have started to attack Tiragard Sound and we're gonna need to have to deal with that. Now, who wants to see a video? Yeah. All right, let's take a look at Tiergard Sound.
Moving on to dress far. There's a Q&A tomorrow. You can ask your questions there. Uh, moving on to dress far. Dress far is a forested mountainous region that's located in the southwest part of Kul Tiras. Lord and Lady Waycrest govern this region, but in recent months, they've been suspiciously absent from public affairs. And this has been a huge cause for concern for the people that call this place their home. Now, this absence has also put a stop to the main contribution that Dress Bar makes to Kultiris. Arms and sausages. I'm, honest, on, <laughs> I'm honestly not sure what's worse. It feels like sausages is worse. Now, as we're exploring Dress Bar and trying to uncover the mystery of the missing waycrests and restore order and sausages, we'll find that the land is cursed. And you can start that story today on the show floor with a Dress Bar playable demo. So after we're done here, make sure to get out there and give it a go. Let's take a look at a video for Dress Bar. Last up in Kul Tiras, we've got Stormsong Valley. Now, unlike Tiergard Sound and Dressfar, Stormsong Valley is lush, green, and beautiful. The area is ruled by House Stormsong, and the people of this region are devoted to the sea with a fanatical religious fervor. Now, they're led by a group known as Sea Priests. It's through, Storm, it's through Stormsong and the Sea Priests that the mighty Kul Tiran Navy is built. Every ship Every piece that goes into every ship must first be blessed by the sea priests before the vessels are deemed seaworthy. They take their shipbuilding really seriously here. Now, when we get to Stormsong, we'll find that shipbuilding operations have come to a stop as ancient dark forces are attacking from the sea. And quillbores. <laughs> lots and lots of quillbores. Let's take a look at a video of Storm Song Valley. Right. Beautiful. All right, so we've gotten a glimpse into the areas and zones of Kul Tiras. Let's switch gears and take a look at Zandalar for the Horde. <laughs> Woo! So without a doubt, troll civilizations are some of the oldest on Azeroth. And the Zandalari Empire is no exception, having been formed some 16,000 years ago. Now, the island we know as Zandalar today was actually once a landlocked mountain range, but the Sundering changed all of that 
when the mountains and most of the empire sank into the sea. But trolls are a hardy and resourceful race. They adapted to island life and over thousands of years mastered the seas. Today, the Zandalari have a navy that rivals, if not surpasses, the Kul Tirans, which makes them a very attractive ally to the Horde in this battle for Azeroth. But when we arrive there, we'll find that things are not going great for the Zandalari. And before we can get them to join us, we're going to need to restore some order. Like Kul Tiras, Zandalar is broken up into three main regions. We've got Zuldazar in the south, the Swamp of Nazmir in the northeast, and the Desert of Voldun in the northwest. Let's take a look at the zones of Zandalar. All right, so starting with Zuldazar itself. Zuldazar is the capital city of the Zandalari and also the only safe refuge the Zandalari trolls have in this region. They're being attacked not just from outside their borders, but from within. This will also be the capital of the Horde in this expansion as they try to keep this empire from falling apart. Now, when we first arrive at Zuldazar, we will meet King Rastakhan and his daughter, the mighty Princess Talanji. And with Talanji, we will explore and investigate a potential uprising from within Capital City. And if that weren't bad enough, blood troll invaders from the north, from the swamps of Nazmir, are hammering the borders of Zuldazar, making things really hard for the Xanilari. Let's take a look at a video of Zuldazar. Epic. Videos are nice, but they don't even do the, the actual zone justice. Once you get in there, it's amazing. Okay, on to one of my favorite zones, Nazmir. Now, before the Cataclysm, Nazmir was a lush forest. But when Deathwing broke the world, he shook something loose, and Nazmir started sinking into the sea. Today, it's a wretched, festering swamp, which turns out is the perfect environment for blood trolls to thrive in. The same blood trolls attacking Zulazar today. Now, to defeat these blood trolls, we are going to need to enlist the aid of powerful Loa. Now, for those of you that don't know, Loa are basically gods to the trolls. Up there, we've got one Samdi, who some of you may know, and, and Kragwa, the frog Loa, who you'll definitely want to know if you want that sweet frog mouth. I know you do, I know you do. Now, as we're digging through the muck in Nazmir, we will uncover ancient Titan secrets and a Titan facility. And inside that facility, there might hold the key to destroying all life on Azeroth, which clearly we do not want. And I hope the Alliance is paying attention here. There are things you're going to need to do as well. And you know what's awesome? Nazmir is playable today on the show floor. So. How'd that get in there? Chris Metzen, good lord. So let's take a look at a video of Nazmir.
Yeah. All right, last up for Xanalar, we've got the Desert of Voldun. Would you believe that Voldun was once a vibrant jungle? You, you probably believe that, it's, it's totally plausible. But all of that changed when the Akir, this mighty, savage group of old god minions, attacked this region thousands of years ago, leaving nothing but desert and ruin in their wake. So, what do the Xandalari do with an uninhabitable desert? Well, they use it to basically send off their criminals to. And most of them die. Most of them. Now, as... Yes, indeed. As... They're even cuter in person. As we explore Voldun, we will come across a native race of fox people known as the Volpera who I know we will be compelled to help because of just how cute and cuddly they are. I just want to eat them up. And Voldun's got its share of baddies as well, like these snake men, the Sethrak, who will make sure that your stay here is unpleasant. Let's take a look at a video of Voldun. All right. And that was Zandalar. Before I hand off to Ian, I want to take a minute to talk about character stories. In Legion, we did the character story for Illidan, and we really liked how that turned out across the patches. And which, by the way, it's, it's not quite done yet. It'll get there pretty soon. Um, so. For Battle for Azeroth, we want to do a lot more of that. Uh, we want to involve more characters. So we want to follow the lives of Anduin, the Lion of Stormwind, and Sylvanas as they lead their people through this war. And of course, we're going to adventure with Jaina as she goes to her homeland, Kul Tiras. We'll find out where she's been, because I know you're all asking. Where she at, is at today, and most importantly, where she's going. What about Thrall? Where is the orc that founded this new horde? What's his place in all of this? And lastly, we're not going to go to the cradle of troll civilization without exploring the story of our favorite troll, Vol'jin. Thank you, everyone. You've been an amazing audience. Ian's up next. We told you we'd get back to Vol'jin. Thank you, Alex. Okay, so you have just heard all about the world that you're going to be exploring. Let me start talking a bit about how you're going to be exploring it. So just some of the basics first. So as Alex mentioned, we have six zones spanning two continents. Three on Kul Tiras, three on Zandalar. And because of the nature of the story here, the way you're going to level up Alliance players will head off to Tiragard initially, Horde players will head off to Zoldazar, and you will level to 120, primarily in your own faction's continent, as you learn to understand their problems and solve those problems. We're still gonna have the scaling zone tech we had in Legion, so you can pick which of the three zones you wanna start in, which problem you want to solve first, play your way through those content as you, as you prefer. Now, at max level, the entire world will open up to you, effectively doubling the amount of outdoor space that you'll be actively engaged in when you are 120. 
Now, it might be easy to lose track as you are dealing with the problems of the Kulterans and of the Zandalari. It might be easy to lose track of the larger conflict in which Azeroth as a whole is embroiled. And so just as we had the Garrison campaign in Warlords and the Class Order campaign in Legion, we have two epic Alliance and Horde war campaign arcs that will weave their way throughout the level up experience and beyond, anchoring you in the larger war consuming the world, as well as beginning to lead you to the opposite faction's lands. So you'll start to build up some outposts in Kul Tiras as a Horde player. You'll start to build up some outposts in Zandalar as an Alliance player that will set the stage for the eventual 120 experience when it all opens up. Now at max level, there will be world quests, there will be emissaries. We're very happy with how this has played out in Legion. We want to continue to build upon it, refine it, learn from what's worked, what hasn't. But that structure is here to stay. Now, let's start talking a little bit about features. So allied races. So as we've heard, the lines of battle here have been drawn. It's hard to remain neutral in Azeroth going forward. Alliance and Horde are looking for all the help they can get. And part of what that means is seeking out potential allies, turning to friends that we've been through great hardship together, and seeing if they will join our cause. And you, as a champion of the Alliance or champion of the Horde, are going to be one of the, those doing that. You will reach out to these allies, see what other problems they have, see if they will join the Alliance, see if they will join the Horde, playing through custom quest content that tells the story of how Philistra and the Nightborn come to join the Horde, or how Alaria and the crack elite squad of elves that she has trained to harness the power of the Void come to make their home in the Alliance, hardening the rift between her and her sister. You will play through those quests, and once you do, you will unlock the ability to make that allied race as a new character across your account. So, so unlike traditional races where you just buy the expansion, you can make them right away, this is something that has much more story context to it. This is something that will be earned. We need to tell the story to explain why these races came into the faction, and it's up to you to make it happen. Now, allied races, like regular races, have new racials that are appropriately flavorful for where they're coming from. Varied customization, as makes sense for what the race is. Lightforged Drenai have various holy markings across their body that you can customize. Lots of facial hair options, of course, for the Dark Iron Dwarves with their ember-flecked beards from their time by the Forge. But one difference is that allied races actually begin at level 20. They're a bit more advanced, and we know that if you're playing one, you're a bit more advanced as a player. You're already established in World of Warcraft. So you will start off venturing to Stormwind, venturing to Orgrimmar as a fledgling, fledgling member of your race, looking to aid your new allies. You will adventure throughout the world, do what you can on their behalf, and eventually make your way to join the front of battle at max level. Now, you can race change if you want once you've unlocked them. You can boost an allied race. We don't want to limit those options. If you've played, let's say, a Dwarven Paladin for years, but in your heart of hearts you've always wished you could be a Dark Iron Dwarven Paladin, we don't want to make you make a new character or abandon your main to make that happen. But at the same time, we also want to make sure it doesn't feel like that's the right or only or efficient way to do this. So if you level an allied race from 20 all the way to max, you will unlock a set of heritage armor, a cosmetic appearance that reflects the essence of what it means to be a Nightborn Elf or a Dark Iron Dwarf that you can show off so that everyone who sees you understands what you've done. So just to sum up here, we have six, we have six allied races coming with Battle for Azeroth, but this is a system that's a foundation upon which we can continue to build in the future. Azeroth is full of countless potential allies, and we can use all the help we can get. So we're very excited about this as a starting point for something greater to come. And so for Horde, you will be turning to the Nightborn in the High Mountain with whom you fought and whom you aided in the Broken Isles, as well as if you are successful in your journey on Zandalar, the Zandalari Trolls. Meanwhile, the Alliance find fast new allies among the forces of Argus, the Lightforged Drenai, the Void Elves under Alarius tutelage, and they'll work with Mora to rekindle and bring the Dark Iron Dwarves into the Alliance formally. 
So I know you caught a quick glimpse of these allied races during the feature reveal, but let's take a much closer look. Check out this video. So, pretty cool. Um, one, one, one nice thing about the cosmetic armor sets, and you saw all those heritage armor sets in that video, is as cosmetic transmog appearances, these are universal. So if you, for example, played a dwarven caster and always wished you could have a more battle mage type look, doesn't matter if you wear cloth, you can still transmog it to look like that dark runic male and show that off. So now, I just mentioned that we are inviting players to journey through Azeroth once again, to start off with these allied races at level 20 and explore. Now, if you've done something like that recently, you've probably noticed the experience is kind of rough around the edges. Now, the content, the world, the stories, those hold up. Those are, those are great. There's humor. There's life there. But the pacing of the experience is all off. If you're trying to play through, let's say, Hillsbrad, you'll quickly find that about halfway through the zone, a lot of the quests in your log are turning green or even gray. On the one hand, all the mechanics of the game are telling you to get out of there, to move along for better rewards, more experience, a place where you belong, while the story is telling you to stay because you want to see what happens next. We want to solve that. Now, in Legion, during the level up experience, we introduced the concept of scaling zones, and that allowed players to pick and choose their way through that experience. So, you have it figured out. I don't even need to give this presentation. But no, you, you can see where this is going. So we are looking to take that tech and expand it to the entirety of World of Warcraft. Yeah, we, are, we are super excited about this, too. There'll be a couple of little differences in how it plays out here versus how it did in Legion. Um, so first off, not, you know, we, don't, we don't want Westfall to scale all the way up to, let's say, level 110. So within these regions, there are level ranges with minimums and maximum levels for two reasons. If you are a brand new undead, you're a Forsaken starting off in Tyrus Fall Glades, we think it's important that when you look eastward towards the Plaguelands, there's a little bit of terror there. That's a scary, dangerous place. You're not strong enough to go there. And if you try, Welcome Bear will come out and hug you, and then you'll be back at your graveyard. And that's, that's how it works. On the other hand, if you're a seasoned adventurer returning from a campaign in Northrend, and you come back to Elwyn Forest and find that the wolves and the bandits there are now still an even match for you, that kind of undermines your progression. So we're thinking about a structure more like, imagine Westfall scales from 10 to 60. Imagine Burning Step scales from 40 to 60. You're never going to out-level the zone while you're in it, but there's still some sense of progression. And once you've moved past the entire expansion, you do feel like you have surpassed it and you are more powerful. Now, speaking of expansions, we'd also like to take a step back from just zone choice and think about how you navigate expansions in the course of leveling up. So if you've leveled alts recently, you know the drill. You hit 58, you go to Hellfire Peninsula, you maybe do a zone and a half or so, depending on how many dungeons you're doing. Then it's off to Northrend. Well, what if you could choose? What if Burning Crusade content scaled all the way from 60 to 80? It's pretty self-explanatory. BC, 60 to 80. Wrath, 60 to 80. Similarly, Kata, 80 to, or sorry, uh, yeah, 80 to 90. Mists, 80 to 90. You can pick one expansion, do much, most of its content if you want. You can bounce back and forth between the two. It's flexible. The point is player choice. The point is having the experience that you want to have as you're leveling through WoW. 
And yes, this applies to dungeons, it applies to all the rewards along the way. So yeah, we are, it's awesome to hear the excitement. We are every bit as excited about this. And because it's something that really is, it's not really an expansion feature, it's just a basic improvement to the game, we want to get this in your hands sooner. So. You may have noticed the patch that just went live was 732. That was a small infrastructure thing. We have a proper 735 around the corner. It'll be coming to PTR in just a few weeks. And you will be able to see the beginnings of many of these improvements there. We can't wait to hear your feedback. We want to get this in your hands ASAP. All right. Now, a all new feature. Wasn't mentioned in the features trailer. So, the battle for Azeroth is a battle between the Alliance and Horde for control of our world, but it's also a battle in which we will all be asked to stand up to safeguard our world. We will need to fight for it, for its survival. And in the aftermath of the Legion's attack, our world is actually direly wounded. And Magni, speaker for Azeroth, speaker for her world soul, will reach out to us as some of her greatest champions and summon us where we will commune with the world soul at the very beginning of our journey, and we will receive a gift, a gift from Azeroth herself, an artifact quality medallion called the Heart of Azeroth. Now, your artifact weapons that you currently wield, those will be consigned to history. They will go out in, you know, a... They will receive a proper send-off. That story has yet to be told, but... We'll get there. But your companion in your journeys throughout the battle for Azeroth will be this medallion known as the Heart of Azeroth. And as Azeroth herself suffers, as she bleeds, her life essence actually seeps out throughout the world. It's incredibly powerful. It's a substance known as Azerite. And the unique property of this medallion is that when you encounter Azerite, when you come across it, a portion of that power will be reabsorbed, reconstituted, into this medallion, into this heart of Azeroth. Now, unlike the artifact weapons that you wielded in Legion, this artifact isn't something you're going to customize, doesn't have a huge trait tree to it. But what it does do is it serves as an incredibly potent power source that will unlock latent properties in many of the pieces of armor that you're going to come across and acquire throughout your journeys. So we're going to talk a lot more about this system in detail right back here at 4 o'clock in our gameplay and systems deep dive. But let me give you a quick overview, and then Russ Peterson and others on the team will dive much more deeply at that point. So this is some early UI concept art for how this might play out. Here you see a helmet. And these concentric circles each reflect tiers of powers, where you can choose one tier from each ring, one power from each ring. And your ability to access these tiers, to unlock them, will depend on how strong your amulet is. A stronger helmet will require more levels in your amulet to equip, to access. But basically, when we looked at the artifact system, there were a lot of elements of progression that worked very well. There were others, such as making hard choices between empowering one specs weapon versus another that weren't so great, or lots of the inventory clutter, things like that. We're looking to improve a lot of the aspects of the system. We also want to give ongoing options for choice and customization rather than the artifact weapon system, where you made tons of choices back in September when you were first filling out the tree, but it's been largely linear progression since then. In this world, each piece of armor, in a handful of slots that we select, we currently have three in mind, will offer a potential for customization and choice in a handcrafted way. These are not random traits, unlike the Netherlight Crucible. A helm is a helm is a helm, and you can pick what you want to suit your play style, to suit your needs as you progress through the world. Again, more about this later. Now, islands, island expeditions. So many of you may have been wondering as you saw the feature trailer, when you saw you know, plunder uncharted isles, you're probably wondering to yourself, what is an island? Well, an island is a body of land surrounded on all sides by water. <laughs> Moving on. OK, so island expeditions. Island expeditions have you exploring uncharted isles scattered across the Great Sea. 
as we've mentioned, Alliance and Horde are locked in this stalemate, and they're seeking all the aid they can get. And there's all this unexplored land with reports of azurite, this substance I mentioned earlier, bubbling to the surface, as well as other unclaimed resources that could aid the war on the home front. And so Alliance and Horde are both sending their scouts out to scour the sea in search of these locations. And that will naturally lead to the Horde and Alliance coming into conflict in the New World over these small pieces of territory as they each try to claim these resources and take them back home to fuel the war. Now, what does that mean for you, the player? So Island Expeditions are three-player cooperative gameplay, role agnostic, and they are a culmination and a reflection of lessons that we have learned throughout many years of developing content, many expansions worth of content development, ranging from Mystifendaria scenarios to scaling difficulty in Mythic Keystone dungeons to randomization and variability of world quest spawning and more. The theme here is one of exploration, of when you set out for an island, when you set out to an island, you don't know exactly what you're going to find. Even if you've been to that island before, on one visit, a given island might be occupied by a settlement of trolls. Some are peaceful, and if you work with them and perform quests for them and solve their problems, they will give you some of their stores. Others are hostile. You might return another time and find that an ancient curse has wiped out life on the island, and undead are rising from their graves, and there are crypts for you to explore. Yet another time, a band of marauding mogu might have come from Pandaria, taken over the island themselves, and set up shop. In all of these cases, you're going to find different friends, different enemies, different challenges, different events, different objectives. It's going to be one of the most, if not the most, variable, dynamic, replayable experiences we've ever offered in World of Warcraft. And to really <laughs> and to add another layer of dynamic gameplay here, again, as I mentioned, this is about Horde and Alliance skirmishing. And so as you and your two allies roll up in a Horde ship, you will also find that shortly thereafter, three agents of the Alliance have arrived. Now, these are NPCs, but they are not any NPCs that you've ever seen before. They're not just looking to run up to you and punch you or cast fireballs at you. They're not like scripted boss encounters. They're a bit smarter than that. They'll behave strategically. They'll behave tactically to complete objectives on the island and to thwart you as you try to do that as well. So even if you were on the exact same island, it still wouldn't play out the same way twice because you're contending with variable opposing forces and having to deal with them the whole way through. And finally, if you want to match wits against three other players, you can do that too. And so these island expeditions can create an all new type of PvPvE gameplay where you are completing objectives, racing against enemy players to do so, and killing each other where it makes sense. All right, so on the other end of the spectrum, from Island Expeditions. Island Expeditions are small-scale skirmish in the New World. War fronts tell the story of large-scale battles back on the home front. This is the Battle for Azeroth between the Alliance and the Horde. This is what all the resources are for. This is what the alliances are for. This is the fight that we need to win. And what does large-scale battle mean for us? Well, we have so much fantasy to draw upon here going all the way back to the real-time strategy roots of the franchise, going back to Warcraft 2, going back to Warcraft 3. Let me give you this hypothetical fact pattern. You are the commander of an Alliance expeditionary force tasked with landing in enemy-controlled lands. Secure an outpost, build it up, secure supply lines, protect them, build up your base, upgrade your buildings, train troops, and then lead them out into enemy territory eventually sieging and overwhelming the enemy fortification and crushing them. I just described about two-thirds of all Warcraft campaign maps right there. <laughs> well, this is World of Warcraft, and let's put you in that experience. This isn't, an, this isn't an RTS. This is you as a champion on the front lines playing out that fantasy, living that experience. What does this mean? A Warfront is a 20-player cooperative raid as you join Alliance Force, as you join a Horde Force, to build up a base and take on a vast enemy entrenched, led by a powerful commander. 
And what you will do along the way is gather resources, build structures, decide whether you want a barracks or a stables collectively, upgrade those things, train troops, upgrade your troops, and lead those troops into battle to claim ultimate victory on behalf of your faction. Now, both islands and warfronts, I've just given you a quick high-level overview. But again, at 4 PM, right back here in our gameplay and systems deep dive, we'll be talking a lot more about both of these features. Okay. Now, the last couple of features I've talked about are primarily PVE features against large NPC armies. Battle for Azeroth is also going to be a great expansion for those of you who love PvP. So first off, we're adding a couple new arenas. We have a new arena coming in Kul Tiras, a new arena in Zandalar, capturing you know, the aesthetics of those places, new environments against, in, within which you can pit your skills against one another. We also have a new battleground coming called the Seething Shore. Now, this battleground is located just off the coast of Silithus. For some reason, the Alliance and the Horde have decided that this barren stretch of desert is worth fighting over. I don't know why there's nothing interesting going on in Silithus, but for some crazy reason, commanders of both factions decided to go fight over it. Weird. But as it turns out, for some reason, there's a lot of Azerite that seems to be bubbling to the surface in Silithus, and this becomes a natural point of contention. So the way this plays out is as a new type of battleground that has dynamic control points. So imagine a Rathi Basin, if there were multiple possible flag locations, and you never knew exactly where the control point was going to spawn, you had to adapt, you had to keep on the move. Here's a quick look at the layout from an internal sketch of this battleground. Each of those crystal nodes you see on the map is a potential point where an Azerite fusion could occur. I think there's about three active at a given time. So as you're skirmishing over control of one, you might see the one has popped up on the other side of the map. You have to make a choice between how many people you're going to keep to try to contest the current one versus who's going to break off and try to claim the new one. Very fast-paced action, keep you on your toes, really excited about this. And it's actually part of the story that we're telling. It's part of the events that will lead up to Battle for Azeroth. So as such, we also want to get this in your hands a bit before Battle for Azeroth itself. So keep an eye on the PTR, and we want to get this coming your way soon. We're also going to continue to expand upon successful systems like the PvP brawls. We want to keep adding new ones. All of those things are here to stay. But that's instance PvP. I know there are many of you where, for whom world PvP is what you're all about. Whether it was 13 years ago ganking noobs in Stranglethorn Vale, making people switch to their mains to come get you, or just being a terror of world quest areas today, it's the thing that you love. And you might feel like it hasn't been treated with the respect it deserves over the years. We agree. In a lot of ways, our PvP rule set for world PvP hasn't really changed since 2005. I guess we got rid of dishonorable kills about 10 years ago. So I guess we should bring them back. No. But the way in which you play the game has changed tremendously. Over the years, server transfers opened up. People want to move around to play with their friends, to find new guilds. As it turns out, most people prefer to transfer to servers where their faction is already dominant, leading to more and more lopsided populations. Ease of travel around the world and power scaling have changed significantly. You could be trying to fight someone, and they could you know, CC you, get away, mount up, fly away. You never see them again. And much more recently, we have cross-realm gameplay. You might join a world quest group in the pre-made group finder. And even though you're on a PvP server, you could join the group and suddenly find that you're surrounded by orange names because you just landed on a PvE realm, or vice versa. In a lot of ways, our rule set doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense for the way the game is right now and how people play the game. That's something we'd like to re-examine. And so I think there's two audiences that we're thinking of as we approach these changes. First off, there are likely many of you in the audience and watching at home who play on PvP servers today, but you actually, it's not really the gameplay you're looking for. You're there because that's where your friends wanted to be. That's where you ended up many years ago. 
you don't want to pay money for a server transfer, you don't want to leave your friends to change that, but you might be actually sitting here hearing about and thinking about this expansion we're talking about, where you'll be venturing into enemy-controlled lands with a bit of trepidation, thinking that sounds actually pretty frustrating. On the other end of the spectrum, there are those of you who love world PvP and feel like, exactly, and feel like that's part of what makes World of Warcraft World of Warcraft. And you want more of it. You want it to be more balanced. You want it to be more interesting. And you want it to occur more organically. We agree. So the core of the changes we're looking at are actually, first and foremost, getting rid of this arbitrary division between PvP and PvE server rule sets, where you know, you're locked in permanently on a given server. And unless you transfer and leave your friends, you can't change that. We want to make this an individual toggle. Unifying our servers into a single rule set. So when you are in Stormwind, you're in Orgrimmar, you're in Dalaran, you can choose whether you want to PvP flag, you want to opt into PvP, or not. And if you do, when you venture out into the world, you'll basically be on a PvP server, a PvP rule set, with other people who've also opted into that gameplay. And if you don't want to, don't. What this lets us do on the one hand, people who feel trapped on PvP servers now have a, an easy way out. On the other hand, we have a foundation upon which we can build a new generation of world PvP content. In the past, whenever internally we would think about and debate ideas for really cool world PvP stuff, it always ran into this roadblock of, well, what does that mean if you're on a PvE server? Does that just mean that half of the players of our game can't access that content meaningfully? And that always felt like a really large stumbling block. We could create all new content, whether it's bounty hunting quests or quests that send you to, to assassinate high value targets in enemy territory and encourage some of that organic conflict and reward it in a way that we never could before. Now, also, we realize you may be hearing this and thinking, well, why would I ever activate PvP just to go out and do my world quests? That feel like this is probably just going to be a bunch of people deathmatching across our zones, turning them into giant arenas. And that's not actually what World PvP is about, right? World PvP is that organic encounter that occurs. And so in order to offset that inefficiency, we do want to offer some bonuses to something like experience gain, reputation gain, where it makes sense for questing with PvP mode enabled. The point of this is not to make this feel like the right or the only way to play if you don't like PvP, but rather to make it feel like it's worth your time if you do. Play the way you want to play. We'll have a lot more to talk about this in the future. But the aim of these changes is to build a foundation upon which we can make World PvP great again. So changing gears a bit, dungeons. So we have 10 dungeons coming your way in Battle for Azeroth. Like zones, each faction will have Separate, separate level up dungeons associated with your continent, four in Kul'Tiris, four in Zandalar, and then all 10 open up when you hit max level and you gain some new motivations to go into some of those places. On the system side, Mythic Keystones, also here to stay. We want to provide better support for that system. We'll be designing more of our dungeons with you know, full knowledge of what this system entails. We also want to provide UI improvements so it's easier to form and find Mythic Keystone groups. If you're just looking for a 10, but you don't care what map it is, you should be able to search for that much more easily, things like that. But refinements, just building upon a system that we've heard fantastic feedback from the community about. We love this as really making dungeons a continued part of the end game. Let's talk about some specific dungeons. First off, Freehold. Freehold is located in Terragard Sound. This is a wretched hive of scum and villainy. It is full of brigands and outlaws and cut purses. And you're going to have to go through this place if you want to put a stop to some of the problems that Kul Tiras is facing. Let's take a look at a video of Freehold.
Yeah, that was an ogre with a shark for its arm, but... Okay. On the other continent, we have a dungeon known as a Taldazar. This is a tomb of ancient Zandalari kings located in the zone of Zoldazar. But there are dark forces present here. Trolls conducting horrible rituals, dinosaurs, undead, undead dinosaurs, and all, all sorts of other threats. Let's take a look at a video for this dungeon. So both of those dungeons are also fully playable here on the show floor today for a total of four separate experiences. Alliance questing, horde questing, alliance dungeon, horde dungeon. Grab four friends, make some new ones, check out the dungeons. We can't wait to hear your feedback. So other dungeons, as I mentioned, there's 10. I'm not going to talk about these in great detail, but these are scattered across the new lands. Special call out to the Shrine of the Storm. This is a dungeon in Stormsong Valley. If you want to see a bit more behind the scenes boss design for this dungeon, check out our boss design panel tomorrow afternoon on the legendary stage. And you can see our encounter team design out one of the bosses in this dungeon live. The very bottom of this list is also a place that's not in Kultiris and not in Zandalar, Kazan. Now, this is a favorite location of ours we've wanted to revisit for some time. Knowing goblins, if you do, you might not be surprised to hear that once word spread of this substance known as Azerite, they immediately set out to dig and dig and dig and see what they could uncover to control it for themselves. And who knows what else they found in the process. Should be a fun trip. Now, moving on to raids. Quickly here, since I don't want to go too, in too much detail into the nature of this raid, because it's hard to do without tremendously spoiling pretty much the whole story of Zandalar, and I don't want to deprive anybody of the experience of learning what happens as intended through data mine broadcast text. <laughs> but this raid is a Titan facility Alex mentioned earlier, located in Nazmir, known as Uldir, Halls of Control. It was once a Titan, effectively a laboratory, a quarantine facility, where they aimed to analyze and try to understand the nature of their ancient enemy, the old gods. It didn't go so well. This place has been shut down, sealed away for thousands of years until now. And we'll have to go in there to face off against the source of Zandalar's corruption. Inside, we'll see a new spin on some Titan architecture, as we see in a concept from one of our dungeon artists here. We'll be facing off against all manner of, of delightfully slimy foes. This little, little tiny person, sorry tank. At least, at least it doesn't have ankles for you to look at. You'll be looking at a belly. Now, this is the first raid. This is the High Mall. This is the Emerald Nightmare of this expansion. Now, following this, and I'm going to say even less about this raid, you, it might have occurred to you when Alex was up here earlier talking about the dark threats from the sea plaguing Kultiris. Well, we know a couple of dark threats from the sea, don't we? There are some that we have heard a lot from in Legion. You know, some Tidestone-related stuff. And so, yes, before all is said and done in Battle for Azeroth, we'll be facing off Queen Ashara against Queen Ashara. So lots more story to tell on that front. And yes. And so the stage is set for the Battle for Azeroth. We have crimson red continent in the west, royal blue in the east, and a vast expanse of ocean in between. We as champions of the Alliance and the Horde will set out to explore islands, battle on war fronts, and uncover mysteries that threaten to undermine the very world beneath our feet. Because at the end of the day, does it matter who wins the battle for Azeroth if there's nothing left for the victor to claim? 
So thank you so much for coming out. Thank you so much for joining us for the beginning of this adventure. It's always a joy. We have so much more information to share over the course of the afternoon here at BlizzCon, starting in just a few hours right back here on this stage. And if you have any questions about what you've heard, submit those questions up at the Darkmoon Fair or online for our Q&A tomorrow afternoon, focused exclusively on Battle for Azeroth content and what lies ahead. Also check out our art panel and legendary stage tomorrow, and so much more. Thank you so, so much. Welcome to BlizzCon. Have a wonderful weekend.